Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Let's talk money. Good evening and welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. I am your moderator for the evening, Glenn Craig. And tonight's illustrious panel is, of course, Kyle Prevo, Miranda Marquit, Peter Anderson, and Tom Drake. Summertime, we all love it. Um, songs have been written about it. We wax poetic over it. But when all is said and done, when the summer's over, you can end up with a big bill. So what do we do about that? What do we do to, to budget for it um, and to cut the expenses if we can? Um, let's go around and... Um, and start out and see. So let's talk first maybe about summer expenses. How are they different from the rest of the year? Somebody like to jump well, in. I, I will jump right in to start here. Uh, I don't think you mentioned it, but that there's a statistic. Uh, according to American Express, the average family of four will spend uh, $4,580 on vacation travel travel this summer. So you know that's, that's quite a bit of money uh, for a summer vacation. But that's just the start of it. You know, you have your summer vacation, and you have other things as well. You have your um, summer sports camps. You have uh, summer camps. You've got day trips, family get-togethers, uh, trips to the amusement, amusement park. Maybe you have a state fair in your area. There, there are tons of things that you're spending money on during the summer. So uh, when it all comes down to it, you're, you're going to be spending thousands of dollars uh, in the summer. So that's really something you, you need to plan for. Yeah, and another thing, too, is um, not only are you spending more, but a lot of the time you're making less money over the summer. I know in my family, my, my husband's a college professor, and, you know, um, he's an adjunct, so he gets paid by the class. And so during the summer, he teaches two classes instead of four. So that kind of cuts back on the income. And then if you take time off work, if you don't have paid holiday vacation days left, and, and you take time off, then you're... Kind of, you've got you know fewer hours. Um, just summer is just a time where you, you ramp up those spending, and at the same time, your income might be falling as well. Yeah, and, and I'm guessing um, that's just one type of variable in income. If you're any type of freelancer or um, any way that your income depends on you doing the work, if you're on vacation for two weeks, you know unless you have it set up to keep going passively. Um, you're not making money while you're there, you know. Especially if you get paid hourly or or on a per diem or or you know, time basis like that. Um, so summer's expensive. How do we how do we plan out the money? How do we plan out our budget for the summer? What's the best ways for us to go about it? Well, I think uh, like like you guys said, vacation is obviously the big thing. So you you got to pretty much save up th throughout the year is one of the things I do. Uh, no different than I save for Christmas. If it's a, a big annual expense, pl plan for it in advance, and then you've got uh, you have the money there available instead of going in the hole to, to try to go on a vacation. Do you have any sort of favorite ways to try to save in advance? Like um, I know I've in the past used online savings, um, and you know I'll set up a separate account just for a certain subject and have money automatically going in there. Does anybody have any? Yeah, here in Canada, uh, sorry, it's, um, we've got the TFSA, which I use for all my uh, all, all my spending like that. <laughs> Anything i got to save up and, and pull the money out at some point within the year, it uh, all piles into there. You yeah, have a tax break. You have, you have to mention that. You have a tax break with your TFSA. <laughs> yeah, I pay no tax on any of the gains. So that's why the, the, everything goes up in there, property taxes yeah. and uh, vacation and Christmas and everything. Yeah, yeah. for me, I, I do something similar to what you were talking about earlier, uh, Glenn. Was, uh, I have an online savings account with uh, Capital One 360, and you can set up sub-accounts with their accounts. So I'll, I'll set up sub-accounts for our vacation budget, um, also for any other s smaller expenditures during the year that, or during the summer that we're going to be having, uh, just because it is a higher spending time of the year. And like you said, uh, there's not always as much income during that time of the year. So we set up a, a zero-based budget in YNAB. Uh, you need a budget. It's a tracking software. And it basically tracks all your income and expenses. All the money coming in is, is allocated to a, a category of one kind or another. 
And so we set up those categories for our, our summer travel or, or whatever. Um, and then as soon as the money comes in, it gets categorized into that category, and it goes in directly to our Capital One uh, sub-account for that category. So we plan a year ahead of time for big summer travel, and, and that way we have 12 months to save for it. So if we want to save uh, you know, $3,000 uh, for the travel for the coming year, we just save uh, that small amount every month. And when it comes around, we have that money ready to go. So, yeah, I'm I'm in a bit of a unique situation in that uh, as a teacher, a high school teacher, I get paid. There's a few different ways different unions do it, depending what state or province you're in. But my school division, what happens is we get paid in 12 monthly installments, but we get uh, July and August's monthly payment in June. So on the last Friday in June, we get this massive amount of money. Well, for us, it's massive as teachers. Uh, three months paycheck uh, in deposit in our bank accounts. And I usually just separate it from within there. I find that uh, I've got enough of a cushion those other months. And I think one of the reasons I have those cushions, and again, it's unique to, to possibly my situation where I live, is that my energy costs are actually substantially lower in the summer, given how cold, prolonged cold it can get here in the winter. And then uh, if you want to take a long trip, um, chances are you want to do it during the winter months, right? So uh, the summer vacations are actually much cheaper in, for many of my friends uh, and, and the people that I tend to vacation with. So one interesting thing to note about the unique situation is how few teachers can actually budget for those three months. Like we're not talking sort of intense budgeting and we're talking people that have some um, post-secondary background or who like to think they're smart anyway. And uh, come September, come the last Friday in September, you would not believe how many people are scrambling, uh, talking about how they've racked up credit card debt or how they've had to learn what a line of credit is. They had to take out a home equity thing. Uh, and that, that's just crazy to me that like the people teaching our kids, some of them teach math, and they can't understand the math of a line of credit. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Well, I think part of the thing, though, is... is I would think that in your situation where you get this massive amount of money all at once, it feels like a windfall and not like a regular type of, um, type, you know, it's not like a regular paycheck. It feels like a windfall, and we all know what happens with windfalls, right? We all know behaviorally, you know, what happens with a windfall, you, you blow it. I mean, that's just what you do with a windfall, even though you yeah, shouldn't. And so, so I think that's, you know, that's another... Um, things to consider too is, you know, how do you react with money? Our problem, my problem is, is we, summertime, even though we, we try and do that whole variable income thing where we have a good month, we, we put extra away and you have a cushion and we have a good emergency fund and, you know, you know, we, we have all these things, but during the summer, we're just, we're kind of okay with carrying small balances on our credit cards on occasion just to ease the cash flow situation. Um, just just because my income is variable and then once summer hits, his income is super variable. And so we kind of, during the summer, we kind of let our cash flow situation just kind of be fluid. And so we are willing to, you know, carry $500 balance on our credit card. You know, it... it Rather than rather than going through the process of getting the money out of the emergency fund, you know, moving it around from our cash cushion, we're we're okay with you know coasting by with the five hundred dollars, and then when you know the school year starts and I bring on more projects and my husband, you know, gets his um, class load back up, then we just pay right off. It's not a problem. So I think oh. you have to really think. <laughs> you brave, courageous soul, admitting that you use credit cards and a personal finance-related topic. I guarantee you, you're going to get hate mail on Twitter. I am so dead. <laughs> I mean, ten dollars that you're going to pay in interest charges for carrying a balance for one month—that is breaking a commandment. So yeah, kudos right? to you for having the courage to say that. <laughs> what? Well, I think really, it's... actually, actually, the credit card that we would carry it on. I'm, I'm very careful about which ones we use. And I've gone to the point where, and to my husband, I'm like, you will use this card. <laughs> you will give me that other card, and you will use this one. <laughs> and, um, but, but no, we've gotten to the point where, you know, the, the one that I would actually use to carry my $500 balance, it's, it's, it's an interest rate, it's a fixed interest rate of 9.9%. 9%. 
So for a credit card, that's not bad. You know, 9.9. .9. Sure, bad. Miranda, whatever you say, I'm going to Google Miranda Marquette credit card articles and see what happens when Google returns 7,993 results. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm ready problem, to be pilloried. Right? Well, you I do know really that's... <laughs> well, I, I just want to say I, I think that's an interesting point that you make there, Kyle, in that credit cards aren't evil. I mean, you know, it's okay for us to say that. Um, when you're paying interest, they give you an interest rate on the year, and yeah, it, it um, yeah. can compound, but if it's only for like a month or two and it's really just a few hundred dollars and you can pay it off at the end of the year, you're really just paying a convenience charge. You probably, depending on your vacation, <laughs> you might be paying more for ATM fees um, for foreign banks, you know, than you probably are on, on your credit card. Well, and actually, that was what I was going to say. I was going to say, you know, we look at that and we say, yes, we know that we are going to pay 9.99%, well, and APR, so when you divide it out, whatever. But we look at it and we're like, okay, yes, we're willing, you know, we are willing to pay that. And, and I've talked in the past that I'm okay with paying the convenience fee. I, I pay an extra $50 for my plane ticket so I can leave at the time of day that I find convenient. So, like you said, this is something that we know we're going to do, and it's something that we've looked at and we've said, you know, for the ease, for the convenience of it, we're willing to pay that. And you know what? I guess let the hate come. I don't know. <laughs> no, but see, you uh, you have the ideal situation that you're dealing with here. You, you're the you're good uh, personal finance. You, you pay attention to your finances, and you're paying it off every month or every two months, whatever it is. But what 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 happens when it comes to the family who is is putting all these summer charges on their credit cards. They're putting the $4,580 for a vacation. They're putting the $400 for the summer camp on there. They're putting the $300 for the summer sports camp, day trips, all that stuff. It adds up, you know, and before they know it, they've got seven or $8,000 in credit card debt. And uh, they're like, well, you know, it might take me a bit longer. And they're well, paying a whole lot more in interest than, than you are. Well, I think yeah. Well, I think part of it though is it's not so much you know. I think it goes back to mindfulness because you know we're not just like oh swipe 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 everything you know. Well, we do technically because we do it for the rewards, but you know we track that. I track every time I use a credit card. I go into my personal finance software and I say this is what I've done, and I make a note of it. And I'm you know I'm prepared for. You know what we're gonna we're gonna pay it off at the end of the summer when you know Josh's class load is back up to four classes and everything else. So I was just gonna mention, Peter, you're looking at this all wrong. Sure, they're eight to ten thousand dollars in credit card debt, but they got twenty thousand rewards miles. So they are like, <laughs> they can upgrade one ticket to like almost uh, first class for you know three four hundred dollars in interest. So that's a fair change. <laughs> <laughs> If we're going to well, talk about rewards, then okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, so you know, before we we we're only talking about uh, credit cards, and this turns into some sort of uh, travel hacking um, episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's an episode for a whole other day, and that's a whole other science. Um, and and certainly, we could use our credit cards a, as a way of being frugal as well. I think, but that's a, again another discussion. Um, like Peter was saying, I, I think a lot of people do get into debt with their vacations. Um, is it worth it? Uh, you know, like, are there any pressures that, that you have to go on vacation, that you have to spend a lot of money? You know, what do you do? Uh, you know, what's what's the average family do? How, how do you, let's look at some ways maybe that we could save um, for the summer so that it's not such an exorbitant expense. So what are some favorite things that some of you um, would like to do in the summer? I think, Miranda, you've, you've discussed... Um, outside by how you like to go camping and hiking. Yeah, yeah, we're all about the camping and hiking, and it's pretty inexpensive. Um, we, we stick, you know, within within five hours of home, and, um, yeah, we can, you camp and you hike, and instead of, you know, paying $100 for a hotel room, you pay 20 bucks to stay overnight in a campsite. Um, and as my, hus as, as my son gets older, um, and, you know, the, the facilities and the amenities aren't as important, you know, I, I can take him backcountry, you know, the way I used to do things when I was in college and, and everything. So, <laughs> right now you can't, but, but it is. I, I mean, it is a really fun family activity, and kids really like it, and, you know, it, 
it's inexpensive for the most part. Um, and even the gear, if you get it on sale in the fall and then use it the next year, and really, if you're careful with it, you only have to buy it, you know, once. So it is, it's pretty inexpensive, and it's one way that we do a lot during the summer without spending a lot of money. And I think also, even if you don't have the gear, because I know a lot of people uh, might be afraid of jumping into it, you know, if I don't have a $300 tent and a $200 backpack, I think there's a lot of places where you could rent a lot of that equipment as well. Um, or do like out of your car camping where you don't need to have as much um, hardcore equipment, you know. So, yeah, I mean, definitely I've done camping as well, and, it, you know, you still spend a little bit of money, but you're going to spend considerably less than when you're staying at a four-star hotel, uh, you know, in Europe, let's say, or something along those lines. Um, and, and if you've got little kids as well, you can do, do the uh, backyard camping. You don't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Just go out in the backyard, pitch a tent back there, and, and they will have the time of their lives, but you don't have to go and even pay the campground fees or anything like that, so... <laughs> Probably not, not. Doesn't work as well with kids. So, Kyle, I understand um, you like to do cottage vacations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, sort of where I live here in the Canadian Prairie, uh, the the summertime is when you want to be in Canada, and there's all this like pretty reasonably priced uh, lakefront or riverfront property. Uh, so. The cottage life has a lot to offer. Um, now, granted, those costs can ring up in a hurry, so I guess I'll put a little asterisk beside cottage life. Uh, so when you buy a cottage, you have to factor in things like an extra tax, an extra taxation, extra maintenance costs, uh, depending on what, uh, what sort of cottage you're looking at. There's various different fees that can be attached. One interesting option um, I've seen several families use, and it's a lot more reasonable than one would expect, is actually renting a cottage. Uh, you can rent some gorgeous cottages for uh, several hundred dollars a week, uh, and people look at that and they go, "Well, why would I pay that? I could just pay the mortgage on a on a cottage of my own." Yes, but you don't have to go there and do the maintenance every two weeks. Uh, if you only show up four or five times a summer, you can begin your vacation as soon as you get there. And what you might pay, you often make up for in recreational costs if you're going to go on like a big city vacation, because all your recreation is usually included in those cottage prices. So all your swimming, your biking, canoeing, etc., uh, all comes into play. And especially if you have a family, I think there's pretty good value there. Yeah, well, yeah I, I was just gonna say I remember when um, when I was in junior high, my family went um, on a vacation. We just rented a condo, and it was much easier for our family and five kids. It was much easier to have that condo, and it was cheaper overall than like getting a couple of hotel rooms and you know, per night. So. Yeah, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> we went on vacation, and we went to uh, Portland, Oregon, and we actually stayed there for about four weeks. We really wanted to take the city in, and rather than getting a hotel or a motel, we went through um, Verbo, VRBO, to uh, rent a condo, and it was like a three-story um, house, basically had its own kitchen, had everything in there, and it ended up being cheaper um, than any hotel or motel, and we were able to share it with friends also, so we were able to um, defray the costs with them. Um, so it ended up being a, a much less expensive option and really allowed us to kind of set our own pace there too. So there are, there are alternative housing um, options that are out there that you can help lessen the load. Um, Tom, you have uh, talked about using business vacations um, yeah, I like to, uh, as you guys all know, I like to kind of network with some of the other uh, bloggers and everything. And uh, if, if, if I'm going to go somewhere, I'd rather kind of make it a business trip. Uh, we just went to Disneyland uh, maybe two months ago. And to, to make it actually a, a, a legit business trip, I, uh, I, I, I probably organized um, I think somewhere over 10 people we all got together and uh, met up there and uh, had a little little uh, blogger meet up uh, about two blocks away from Disneyland. And uh, while I was down there, I just happened to have a vacation. Uh, I've done the same. I've gone up to Winnipeg to visit family and met up with uh, Kyle's uh, blogging bestie, Justin, there. And uh, <laughs> uh, same deal. <laughs> you go for business and you just happen to have some personal uh enjoyment out of it at the same time and it, it keeps some of the expenses off of my side because the business pays for it uh, 
even if someone was the sole proprietor, it's uh, at least a tax deduction, if nothing else. Um, it, it's a good way to go. Uh, obviously, we still save money on the trip wherever possible, uh, using different online sites and everything like that. I don't just uh, book it and go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I completely I agree with that. So we, all of us have been to the, uh, the Financial Blogger Conference as well, and I, every time I've gone to that conference, I, I always take that conference and turn it into uh, a family trip as well, where I'll have my, my wife will come down on the last day or the day afterwards, and then we'll, we'll spend a couple of days in whatever city uh, that the conference is in. So nice way to mix business and pleasure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I guess this is where we, we put in the, the little legalese at the bottom of the site here, but um, <laughs> you definitely want to make sure you check with your accountant and your, your tax laws and such and make sure that you are doing enough to make it a legitimate business expense. Um, you can't just go somewhere, type off a business email, and, and call it an expense. You have to make sure you're, you're doing that's, that's all the proper things and, and making the, the proper documentation as well. Because I don't want anybody listening to get in trouble. Think they can do just about anything. <laughs> That's right. So um, let, let's talk about maybe some other ways that we could um, lessen the burden for uh, our, our summers. So what can we do that that's relatively inexpensive that that would save money? That's really just like fun for the family, fun for everyone. Um, hey, Glenn. I I wanted to maybe just – this is a good opportunity to break in, and I don't want to hijack your tangent in the conversation, but I think it does fit in because I see these commercials for RVs all the time, and it's always like, you know, responsible budget life, and like you can RV anywhere, and it shows like this perfect family where the kids are perfectly behaved in this contained space, and uh, I just – I don't understand when I look at the economics of owning an RV, which you pay twenty to $40,000 for, possibly even more, uh, up front – and then you pay like twenty, thirty dollars a night to hook up, and your gas bill, whether it's a pull behind or a all in one unit, goes through the roof. And maybe I'm looking at this all wrong, but I just can't see where the efficiencies are built into it. So can anyone defend this? Am I looking at it totally backwards or what? Well you you can totally rent one, you see, for for like ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars, you know. So so you can save that way if you just rent it. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I think I think the popular thing right now isn't it to get somebody to sponsor your RV trip? Isn't isn't that what you do now? <laughs> you can get someone to sponsor your RV trip? That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Adam Baker did. Yes, yeah. Right, Adam <laughs> Baker. Years ago. What are, what's um, Jeff doing? What's Jeff Rose doing? Are they actually paying for that RV, or did he get a sponsor? Does anybody know? I think it's just a normal rental. Oh, it's just a rental. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's the first family that came to mind when Kyle's like, "Oh, the perfect family." I'm like, <laughs> I, I've definitely uh, daydreamed about doing that, but um, I, I think Kyle uh, hit upon something there. You know, I, I don't know if my kids would drive me nuts uh, in the RV driving for that long, so uh, <laughs> we, we might have to put off that that idea for a little well, while. Well, and here's the other thing. Like, I know Peter is even taller than I am. And uh, assuming that some of his uh, offspring are going to inherit his Scandinavian Viking genes there, uh, oh, yeah. I'm just not comfortable in an RV. Like, I'm way too big for everything in there. And uh, I would assume, I don't know, have you ever spent any extended periods in them, Peter? I have not, no. RVing is not yeah. uh, something I've ever really cared to do that much. But, but again, with the RVs, you know, it comes back to that whole owning versus renting thing. I can't see how it would be a, a good deal to own one, but I can see maybe renting one for a weekend or a week-long trip or something. But, yeah, it, the maintenance costs and the gas, if you're driving all over the country, it, I, I can't see doing it. I don't know if it makes it a, a, a great deal, but uh, I know an RV can be a great thing to buy used as well because it depreciates like heck. You, you can, <laughs> yeah, it's like a car, except someone might drive it two times a year. <laughs> so you can right. buy a ten-year-old one that's a, a decent deal, and and then go park it in the Walmart parking lot. So <laughs> save some money there too. I know if yeah. I if I'm going in an RV, I want the one from Stripes. You remember that one? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, that's I always think just, just look just looking at the basic math. If you pay forty thousand dollars for a new one, that's forty one thousand dollar cabin rentals you could have. So like I don't know. Again, all the other all the other costs you put into it too. Maybe someone out there. There's some RV marketer that's screaming at their screen right now, but uh, I just don't get it personally. I I think um 
I think the RV is um, an extension of something else that we'll talk about right now is the, the staycation. Um, you know, that's, the RV is like a, an extended long distance staycation. But um, anybody like to actually talk about what a staycation is? It became a popular term once the, the Great Recession hit and people couldn't afford to go on big vacations and play for, uh, pay for flight tickets and hotels and whatnot. Um, would somebody like to, to just give a few words on what that is? Yeah, just uh, you're staying close to home and, and basically vacationing in your, your local regional area and, and acting like a tourist in your area and just finding fun things to do with your family and, and uh, maybe finding free or frugal things to do uh, since you're staying home because of money reasons anyway, usually. Um, you know, finding free things to do in your area like museums or zoos or uh, local festivals, uh, going to free concerts, movie in the park maybe. Um, things like that, but just basically having fun in your regional area and acting like you're coming from somewhere else and going to see all the tourist spots that you might come to see if you were from somewhere else. And even if it's uh, not free all the time, it can also just be cheap. Even the fact you're not having a hotel and everything, it can be cheap. Like uh, if, if I go to a city, I've got to do everything there that's touristy. But in my own city, I haven't done a lot of the stuff, so I, I, I need to have a good staycation. Um, we're, we're looking at doing some of that this summer uh, with my boys just two and four. Traveling isn't working that's so great. <laughs> like that trip to Disneyland coming back, uh, it's, it's easier to keep them around the house. And, uh, and my oldest boy just uh, finished his preschool today, so uh, we'll be looking to, to fill this time with uh, things like museums and even using an entertainment book to get some... Uh, get some deals within within your local area. Yeah, one thing I like to do too uh, with the staycations is just to uh, visit a lot of the uh, roadside attractions in my state. You know, the funny things like the, the world's largest ball of twine or uh, Big Ole, the 50-foot Viking, you know, or uh, <laughs> the giant northern pike that's also a restaurant or, you know, just weird stuff like that. That's, that's one of my favorite things to do, so... <laughs> You can check out uh, roadsideamerica.com if you want to see which ones are in your local area. Paul Bunyan and the Big Blue Ox in Bemidji is a favorite Minnesota attraction of mine. <laughs> I have been there. One of my favorites. <laughs> so for sure, if you're not taking advantage of local papers and, um, and local um, listings to see what's coming around, I mean, I know by me, uh, there's just, in the summertime, there's just always something somewhere on some boardwalk, some beach, some small town, some fair, festival, concert, um, fireworks show. I mean, there's a ton of stuff out there if you look for it and plan for it. Um, but um, I, I think you were you were talking about keeping the, the kids occupied, Peter. So, mm -hmm. you know, summertime, now that I've got a bunch of kids that are getting older, a big expense is the kids. You know, you, you send them to summer camp or d whatever you do, it's going to be that much more money because now you got to buy plane tickets for them, you got to buy food for them, or you send them to summer camp. Um, how do we cut down the kids' costs? Uh, well, one thing I, I like to do is just uh, take advantage of all the freebies that are available everywhere nowadays. I mean, you would be surprised at just how many things you can get for free with your kids. Um, for example, uh, you can go bowling for free with your kids. Uh, you know, go to kidsbowlfree.com. Uh, you can sign up there, and, and you can go bowling uh, for free, I believe, one night a week or one uh, one day every week. Um, or there are things like uh, Bank of America has listings of uh, free uh, museums you can go to for free during the week. So you can take all your kids, go to the museum, get in the nice air-conditioned uh, museum in the hot, hot summertime. Um, we have uh, the Home Depots and the low hard hardware stores in our area. They do free workshops for kids every Saturday. So you go in and they have a, a free project for the kids to put together, you know, like a birdhouse or, or something along those lines. Uh, get it for free. They, they show you how to do it. You build it there while you're sitting with the kids. Good bonding time. Um, there are other things, too, like uh, the Lego store. If you have one of those near you, they do, uh, in the summertime, they have free Lego projects that you can come in and do. Each kid will get their own little package with uh, Legos, and they can put together a project and take it home with them. So... If you just look around, there, there are tons of things like that that you can do. Um, we'll put some links to some of these things I just mentioned on the show notes, but but just do a Google search for free kids' activities in the summer, and you'll, you'll find a lot of things to do. And I think um, the library 
you always have to mention the library, I think. But most okay. most libraries your double thumbs up. That's right. <laughs> most libraries have like um, my my library in my local area. They have kids readings, you know, a couple times a week. Um, and then they also have opportunities for the older kids, for like teenagers, to come and do volunteer work and help lead to the younger kids. And so you kind of get this, you know, activity where you've got something for the little kids to do and you've got something constructive for the older kids to do. Um, you can also check with your city's parks and recreation department. I know ours has, you know, neighborhood play um, a couple times a week where they have, a di we go to a different park and they have activities set up. Once again, they have um, teenager volunteers help with the kids and they've got little stations where they play little, you know, like lawn bowling and you know, hoop toss, and just, you know, just fun games like that, where they, they can get in uh, the area with the kids, and it's free, and it's out there in the park, and it's just a lot of fun. So I think if you don't, you know, check with your library, and check with your city parks and rec department, you might be surprised um, about the resources that are available in your town. Yeah, there's, there's so much out there. I mean, I know our library shows uh, free movies, they have classes that you can sign up for, they have other classes that um, they have costs, but they're relatively cheap. So, you know, ours is always publishing, like, every month, just everything that's coming up and, and things that you can do. Um, here's another thing I want to shoot out to you guys. Do you think there's a, a, a keeping up with the Jones acts, um, aspect to summer? You know, like, like, you know, you hear about your neighbors that, that went to Paris for, for three weeks. Like, you know, do you feel like you have to keep up with that or... You know, their kids are going to the, the super expensive exclusive camp and uh, maybe they're missing out if they're not doing the same thing. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's definitely an issue. And it's like super pumped by social media. Like not only am I going to go to Paris, I'm going to take a selfie every three feet. <laughs> and then I'm going to get a plate of food. I'm going to take a picture of six different angles uh, and fill up everyone's Facebook feeds. Or else I'm going to have a summer wedding that's going to be better than all my friends' summer weddings if you're my age. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. We've all written articles about how keeping up with the Joneses will quickly put you in debt, how millionaires don't keep up with the Joneses, etc. But I think it is an issue. Yeah, yeah it I, would I, definitely be an issue. I think especially if you have uh, older kids who are going to uh, summer camps and, and things like that. You know, if they want to be there with their friends and if they don't show up, then they feel left out with all their friends, you know, and so they, you're going to spend two or $3,000 for a two-week uh, summer camp, so... Definitely an issue. It's a hard thing, you know. Yeah, with the camps, that's another thing you just have to budget for sometimes. Or instead of going to the the super big camp, you, you try to find a, a camp that maybe costs a little bit less, or you don't go for the full, you know, four to six weeks. You go for one or two weeks, and uh, and cut it back. But um, yeah, those are a lot of expenses that we that can really eat us up. Um. So let's uh let's all sum it up here, and um, I'll, maybe I'll go around and everybody can kind of maybe just uh, reiterate one of their points on uh, budgeting for the summer and some things that we can save on or ways that we could maybe not spend so much. Um, Kyle, if you could tell us um, a little bit to, to okay. reiterate. Uh, stay the hell away from RVs, number one, and <laughs> likely spending more money won't equal having more fun uh, necessarily. So uh, like these guys have all said, be creative whether you're traveling by yourself with a family. Uh, and finally, uh, before I go fishing here, just check out our blog with all our show notes, everything we've listed on, uh, and Pete's got a monster article that we'll link to. <laughs> um, Miranda, how about you? Any, uh, any closing thoughts? <laughs> Um, I just, I just really think, you know, uh, once again, just take a look at what is coming up with your, uh, your, your spending and, and kind of plan for that. I think too many people just fill up their schedule and don't think about how they're going to pay for it or they don't think about how they're going to make it work. They just fill up their schedule with a bunch of stuff. And then, you know, they're in the middle of it going, what just happened? So I think look ahead and, and kind of plan and, and learn to say no. I guess. To a certain degree, you have to figure out when is enough is enough and then say no. Peter, how about you? Yeah, for me, uh, I think uh, the key is to 
be aware of what your expenses are going to be and set up a family budget to uh, cover those things. Uh, start planning for the expenses you think you might have next summer. You know, start saving for them right now in your savings account. Uh, if, it, if it's right for you, set up a budget and use the software to track uh, how much you're spending or going to be spending and how much you want to save every month. And uh, just be aware of that, I think, uh, is, is my key. Set goals for what you want to save and, and uh, start saving. And Tom, final thoughts. Uh, I think one of the biggest ways to save money on, on any sort of summer vacation is uh, use the Internet to your advantage. Uh, like Expedia or uh, what's it called in the States, AAA here at CAA. Uh, there's loads of deals there. Um, I mentioned the entertainment book before. Like, Not only is there lots of free stuff to do, but there's no reason to, to just pay a full price for anything. There's uh, loads of stuff related towards uh, summer attractions. Great points. I mean, uh, we don't always have to pay you know, everything that's listed there. There are lots of free ways, lots of uh, frugal ways, and uh, lots of coupons and discounts that are out there. So um, with that, you know, you can, you can budget for your summer, you can plan for your summer, and it doesn't have to cost you a whole lot of money. Um, with that, thank you for joining the Money Mastermind Show. Please go to our site, moneymastermindshow.com. Check us out. Follow us along. And until next week, be good with your money. Good night, guys. Thanks for joining us on the Money Mastermind Show. Get more information at moneymastermindshow.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on Google+.